from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Millicent Walker. Tonight, federal government talks tough, vows to invoke the no work, no pay rule if the striking resident doctors fail to return to work by Monday. Resident doctors defy order by the federal government to resume duties, insist on not going back to work until their demands are met. With or without new electoral laws, INEC insists it will deploy more technologies for the conduct of future elections in the country. And Taliban fighters capture a city in southwestern Afghanistan, first provincial capital to fall to the militants since launching their offensive earlier this year. Plus business sports, news from Abuja and later international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, the Department of Petroleum Resources deploys new inventory tool to track petrol diversion in the downstream sector. On sports news tonight, Italy win first ever Olympic men's 4x100 meters relay title. And from Abuja, Chief of Army Staff reaffirms the Army's total resolve to strengthen its fight against insurgency and take the battle to bandits' enclaves as it visits troops in Castina State. And reconciliation talks between the federal government and the National Association of Resident Doctors seem to have broken down as the Minister of Labor and Employment, Dr. Chris Ngege, threatens to invoke Section 43 of the Labor Act, which allows government to implement the no work, no pay policy. The minister says this will take effect by next week, Monday, so the resident doctors fail to return to work. Dr. Ngege, who was visibly angry with the union during an interview on our program Politics Today, frowns at the action of the doctors. No, I won't meet them Why? anymore. I won't, because I have other things to do. I did some two consultations again yesterday. Am I going to be wasting time with them? You, by, you, do you by count it as a waste They of said time? they were happy. They said they were happy. If you look at the media, they were praising me and said that I am kind, I'm compassionate. Uh, they are advising uh, work, uh, public servants in Nigeria to behave like me. Because I took the issue seriously. And where government officials are wrong, I tell them. And I give them uh, an ultimatum of, on, and time frame to, to, to perfect or do whatever it is. So why do you go on strike one week after? You can't. So on that basis, you won't meet them? No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not meeting them. But they're, they're saying that this strike is indefinite. No problem. I have other tools permitted for me by labor laws, and I will do it. Is it true that you have invoked Section 143 of... Uh, Section 43. Section 43 I invoked of the you this afternoon. You did? You yes. did? Have you this communicated afternoon, with them? I have communicated it to that. And what they does that mean? They will not receive money for the period down strike, and it will never count as a period for pensionable position in their career. Is that a fair position? That's what it is. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, even the ILO supports it, because they're on se an essential services. They're not supposed to go on strike without notifying me 15 days to that day of strike. But they, they said they, they notified no, they did. If you look at they, the timeline that said, we showed you, no, Minister, no. there was a notice that they that's wrote. That's a meeting. That's a meeting. Don't, there's what we call trade dispute notification. TDN. I'm, I'm not a labor man. I'm a labor officer now. No, but there's a TDN. They have not done that. If you look at they the history me, of the conversation, listen, listen. I got you. They sent me a communique of their meeting in Omaha, and that communique listed the grievances and resolutions. That's not a notification. It's the resolution of a meeting. I'm not part of the meeting. So they must communicate me directly. So legally, you've not received any notification I've, from them. As we speak, I've not received any notification. But, and that is why I'm, I'm invoking Section 43 of the uh, Labor Act on withdrawal of services, right to strike, and the right to protect the employer and their patients. So your resolve now is no work, no pay. 
Why not? It's and the law. I didn't make it. So you're giving them seven days. Yes. From what I understand. Yes. And seven days started from today. No, from Monday. The, no, they, but they, you gave them. You asked them to resume today. The no, minister no, no, told no, them no, to no, no. resume today. They started a strike on Monday, which is second. My seven days terminates on this Monday. Next Monday. Yes. So uh, after which, you you I'll sack invoke, them. I will invoke other things that are allowed by law. In the meantime, the leadership of the Striking Association of Resident Doctors has called on his members to ignore the order of the federal government to immediately return to work. Speaking earlier today on our early morning show, Sunrise Daily, the president of the association, Dr. Oyelawa Okaisui, insists that they cannot be bullied by authorities to return to work as members can only go back to work after their demands have been met. You can't have signed an MOA with us and remaining everything you have said. And you have not even called us since the beginning of, on 2nd of August, 8 a.m., when the strike started. And the first thing you're telling us is that you signed, signed a document and not honoring it, and we need, we need to resume work. They literally stand up to their responsibilities. Up to now, sir, over 114 members of house officers are still not be, are still having irregularities in payment of their salaries. The head of service brought out a document telling um, um, the house officers they are no longer in the scheme of service. And now the Lagos State Government have adopted that circular, meaning they will not be paid salaries, meaning they will be paid allowances. And the one year of service is not going to be counted for in the civil service. That's one. Two, on the um, um, the GiveMix platform, you are supposed you know that there's a lot of brain drain in Nigeria, and we need to have doctors training and working in our different institutions. As it stands, we have over a thousand seven hundred members under the GiveMix platform, which is a non-regular payment platform. And part of our MOA signed was that those members should be allowed to be migrated into IPs. But as it stands, even after three months of verification by the budget office, the head of service brought out circular again, stopping the capturing of those members. Meaning over three to um, six months have not been paid to them. University of Calabar, University of um, UCH, Ibadan, Port Harcourt, Ilori, Lokoja, have still not been paid salaries. They have not asked why they are not captured. They have not asked why they are, they are irregularities. They've not done anything about them. Well, let's talk about the minimum wage. The minimum wage was a consular adjustment made by President Buhari, Secretary Buhari, and now I have been paid some members. We told you that other members have not been paid. Up to now, nothing has been done about it. In Lagos and other parts of the country, the doctors have stocked to their gun, insisting that until there are strong efforts towards addressing their demands, they will not be resuming any time soon. They're also refuting the claim by the federal government that states should be held responsible for their plight. It's day five in the strike of the National Association of Resident Doctors in the federal and state-owned hospitals and medical centers in Nigeria. Hospitals in Lagos, like others across the nation, continue the strike despite the directive from the federal and state governments asking the medical officers to resume work, as well as the claim by the state government had failed in its obligations to the striking doctors in the state. <laughs> At the Federal Medical Center, Ibutimeta, and the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital, officials of the Association of Resident Doctors are sticking to the position of the national body. The demands are for, we have some doctors that are on this special platform that is called Gift Miss. It's a um, platform for non-regular staff. So we pay their salaries. Because they are non-regular staff, their salaries are non-regular, <laughs> sort of. So it's for them to be paid. They are, they are being owed ranging from two months to six months, 12 months salaries. So pay the salaries so they can come back to work. We're also asking for, um, because we have um, um, members that are in um, state government institutions that are being owed as much as 24 months salary in states like Abia, Imo, Ekiti, and I think Undo. Our issues are into four. 
Number one is that uh, we want the government to also put it in black and white, either that they reverse the circular that was released from the office of HO, or to uh, put it in black and white, whatever the explanation they want to have as regards as that circular is. And of course, the second thing is that uh, payment of the residency training fund. Number three is the, we have, we have heard that there is a proof for massive recruitment. We just want the government to make sure to fast track uh, that process so that, of course, to cushion the effect of the workload on our member. The situation is the same at the Federal Medical Center, Oweri Imo State, where members of the association disagreed with the federal government on its directive to resume work. We are frustrated. A hazard allowance is nothing to write home about. The Nigerian doctors are the least paid across the world. These are facts in the public domain. So the federal government knows what to do. They should go ahead and address the, the fundamental issue so that we can go back to work. In some other places, the doctors dismissed the claim that the states are the ones culpable as only two out of about 10 demands are under the jurisdiction of the state. As we speak now, those, the items highlighted in that MOA are still not being honored. And they are all very simple things that can be sorted out immediately. They didn't have to wait for this long. They didn't have to wait for this strike. Now that, um, unfortunately, we are starting this strike on Monday, it's time for them to act and just do the need for Part of my Hippocratic oath is that I should take care of myself first, after which I can take care of my patients. And if my welfare is not catered for, then I can take care of my patients. My expectation at the end of the strike is that the government will be more responsible in dealing with um, issues that affect the life of doctors and other healthcare workers. The resident doctors are insisting that government at all levels should look into their demands and call for negotiation to bring an end to the dispute. And with most of the state chapters of the Association of Resident Doctors complying with the strike directive, at some uh, public hospitals in the federal capital territory, Abuja visited by a crew, patients were seen unattended to, and a few who got treatment told us that consultants were on hand to render services. This is the National Hospital Abuja, once a beehive of activities. But the ongoing strike by resident doctors has cut the crowd. Those who are here are attended to by senior doctors. All the rooms used to have doctors, but today it's one doctor that's on duty. Usually it used to be, the whole rooms used to be filled up, it used to be, uh, there used to be presence of doctors and, you know, Obviously, patients as well being attended to. While well, coming here today, I found out that it was only just one doctor. We, we hope it will get better at the end of the day. In the Asokore area, the general hospital is almost empty as doctors continue to stay away from their duty posts. On a very good day, Asokore Hospital is a busy hospital and all of that. But you see how quiet the whole place is to tell you that really we are complying with the, with the strike action. Imagine the strike that was resumed on Monday. The, the strike action was suspended over 115 days ago. Why is it taking over three months to migrate workers from the Give Me's platform to the IPPI's platform? Why is it taking so long a time to get the details of house officers who have worked and have not been paid and paid in their money? Why is it taking this so much time to say, okay, hazard allowance review committee that I've met and all of that, yet the hazard allowance is still less than 5,000 naira with the tax? So I think because the strike action has been suspended, work has resumed, and they don't believe that, oh, as usual, they'll go back to their, their cocoon and then continue and wait for when next uh, an industrial action is being served and stuff like that. Things don't work that way. Non payment of salary arrears, hazard allowances, Insurance benefits to families of doctors who died while treating COVID-19 patients are among the many demands of the National Association of Resident Doctors. But the federal government continues to insist that it's working on its part of the agreements, adding the states are the ones defaulting. It's been a whole week of industrial action, which has left patients desperately seeking for medical care in private hospitals. The association seems unperturbed by Thursday's directive for its members to return to work, as patients wonder who will blink first and end their suffering. 
In part two after the break, we'll get more insights into the ongoing industrial dispute between resident doctors and the government. Plus, INEX plan to deepen use of technology for the conduct of future elections in the country with or without new electoral laws. Still ahead, stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channel's Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Federal government talks tough, vows to invoke the no work, no pay rule if the striking resident doctors fail to return to work by Monday. Resident doctors defy order by the federal government to resume duties, insist on not going back to work until their demands are met. With or without new electoral laws, INEC insists it will deploy more technologies for the conduct of future elections in the country. And Taliban fighters capture a city in southwestern Afghanistan, first provincial capital to fall to the militants since launching their offensive earlier this year. Have you ever wondered what role a resident doctor plays in the scheme of things in a hospital? Well, here are several descriptions of who a resident doctor uh, is and what makes them relevant. First is, a resident doctor is a physician who lives in the hospital where he or she works while undergoing specialist training after completing his or her internship. And they do this for three to seven years, a period known as residency. Now, in their role as medical care providers, Providers. Resident doctors work with other members of the healthcare team to provide direct medical care to patients, such as ordering and interpreting diagnostic uh, tests, giving examinations, performing medical procedures, and recording medical histories. Another thing they do, supervising doctors train resident doctors in their desired specialty during residency. Uh, these, some of these specialties include anesthesiology, obstetrics, gynecology, pediatrics, radiology, and then there is surgery. Well, let's take a further look at this burning issue at the moment. And joining us live from Abuja studio is a labor, industrial law and relations expert, Mr. Monday Ajay. Thank you for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you very much. Now, what do you think about the resident doctors' uh, strike on the one hand and then government's position on the other? If you look at the situation critically and the step it taken by the federal government, you will discover that um, the order or the order process of the Minister of Labor in the circumstances is very, very unfortunate. Because when you look at the nature and the service being rendered by this set of individuals, you will appreciate the angle at which they are coming from. And in the first instance, you will discover that there is a particular issue on ground leading to the other action. If the government on its own side have fulfilled its own side of the contract, I think the issue of strike or no strike today wouldn't have been an issue that we'll be discussing today. But because a particular factor or a particular set as fair to discharge its own responsibility accordingly, that is why we are discussing issue of strike or no strike today. And when you have a system or a government who is not willing by conduct on several occasions, we don't need to tell stories about this, that is not willing to obey simple contract, which they were not forced or being made under duress, they enter into this contract willingly on their own. And all of a sudden, they refuse to play their own side of the contract, then it's very, very unfortunate. And that's where the trust and confidence of every citizen hands up. And that's why most of all these things are being played out today. But on the part of the medical practitioner, to me, I must commend them and also appreciate the angle they are coming from because a laborer deserves his wages. But having made that point, no. They should also remember by oath of their office that they must save life first. And not only that, they should also uh, uh, note that um, when we are dealing with human life, there is no room for spare life anywhere. And this course of action or strike must have 
cause a lot of uh, a loss of life, which we can no longer bring back to life. So I, I also advise them that uh, this option of a strike should be sparingly used, and they should look for other alternatives that they will use to press home their demand than putting the lives of people into jail. Because most of these ministers we are talking about, with respect, they don't have their case here. They are entitled to treatment of us here and there. So anything that happens here is the masses that suffer. So for the sake of the masses and the oath of office they are taking, we will appeal to them that they should exercise some level of caution and do the needful for the safety of life of everyone in the country. The federal government's position of um no work, no pay. I mean, is it hasty? Do you think it's, it's reasonable at this time? Le legally speaking, the government have the right to go by that. But when you look at employee and employer relationship, it's a special relationship that um, you don't want to be too harsh about it. And that's why when you get to some of our judgments, it's neither here nor here because uh, the court is always being careful because of the nature of that relationship. The government cannot just wake up and say, look, you will not get your pay because you have not been coming to work when somebody is pressing his own demand. It's not done, it's not proper. In fact, to me, they are adding more problem to the already existing problem, which will not help the system. Naturally, it's just like what I said, legally, but it's not everything you apply law. You must apply human face and do the needful so that the masses, it's just like the case of the two elephant fighting now, it is the masses now that will suffer this. So to me, that's not the best way to go about it or to handle this situation. Well, Mr. Ajay, it seems you're sitting on the first fence, uh, you know, in this case. I mean, these two groups, uh, NAD and then the federal government, they're maintaining hardline positions on this issue. Uh, what should be the, the way forward, the meeting point? The, the way forward is that the government on its own should learn how to honor simple contract. You understand the situation in Nigeria. Apart from medical, the other labor union that are fighting the same cause, the government should learn how to at least obey simple contract. And again, too, the government should also come out with all these employers, I mean employees, and explain to them in case there are certain challenges that will cause them not to fill the outside of the contract. It is then these employees will now have this sense of belonging that look, our employer really have our, 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 our mind, they have us in their mind and then they will suffer that. But the moment you don't even call this individual and citizen with them and explain this to them, all what you are giving is threat and you wait till the last minute. Because when you look at the situation in Nigeria, we like, moving towards the die minutes time. We don't do things at the appropriate time. This individual has given government notices long ago, for how many days, for how many months, for governor to wait in time they will go on strike. And the labor minister will be telling that they have not signed a notice and that. The question is, are the minister, is there any breach of a contract between him and the employees? If the answer is here, why? As a government, I think that's not a good system. So to me, the way forward is for the government to live up to their own expectation. And again, too, the medical doctor should also learn that it's not all power that is given to you by law that you exercise in the interest of the entire nation. Because we're talking about sacrosanity of human life. It's very sacrosanct indeed that the moment you one is gone, you can't get it back again. So they should operate at this level and exercise Contract and also note that there is life to live after this particular government, and they will surely get what they want one day or the other. But life Indeed. is what they, they cannot get. So they should be guided by this principle and maintain the oath of office they have taken so that they will be able to protect life of every citizen. Indeed, especially as we, we battle the pandemic. We'd like to thank you, Labour Industrial Law and Relations Expert, Mr. Monday Ajay. Thank you for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you very much for having me.
Moving on to other stories, we will deploy more technologies with or without new electoral laws. That's according to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. The electoral umpire says it will deploy more information and communication technologies permissible under the existing laws to optimize the gains already made in the country's electoral system. Speaking at the opening ceremony of a two-day retreat for officers of the commission in Kefi, the INEC chairman notes that the commission has been developing other applications with a view to enhancing the integrity of electoral elections since the deployment of the card reader machine in 2015. He added that some of these technologies, which include software to track the movement of elections, materials, as well as the security of staff and materials, will be deployed during the November governorship elections in Anambra State. This is a retreat for the electoral umpire and the use of technology in our elections. And the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, is brainstorming with officials of the commission. The chairman of the Electoral Operations and Logistics Committee speaks on some of the innovations that the commission hopes to deploy in future elections. The second one I want to talk about quickly is the INEC logistics management system. This is designed to be an end-to-end uh, a system that include that runs from procurement of election materials all the way to uh, deployment and retrieval. The final one I would like to talk about is the one the Commission recently approved, and that is what we are calling the INEC Alert. Uh, sorry, INEC Security Alert. Uh, uh, and notification system, INEC SANS. Since 2015, when INEC first introduced the card reader machine, the Commission has continued to push for the use of technology to enhance the integrity of elections. Some of these innovations include the deployment of a logistics tracking system during the Edo and Ondo state governorship elections, the use of ZPART for electronic transmission of results, and the new security tracking system that it hopes to deploy in the November election in Anambra State. The one that is uh, new and innovative that we are deploying in Anambra is the security app um, in view of what happened recently with our facilities in a number of places around the country. So in others, you may have different tools, but they all work towards achieving one and the same goal. There are some activities, some aspects of technology that we have deployed that the laws are already adequate uh, for us to continue to deploy these tools. We don't need any specific provision of laws, for instance, to deploy the EMSC. We don't need any specific provision of the law to keep deepening the use of technology for voter registration, for instance, which we are doing. Elections are perhaps one of the legitimate means of leadership recruitment in any democracy, hence the need to strengthen the integrity of the electoral process. Well, the news at 10 returns. Four killed as bandits attack police station in Osu local government area, Imo State. Plus, the Department of Petroleum Resources deploys new tool to track petrol diversion in the downstream sector. That's on Business News. To join us again. to security. There's been another attack on a police station in Imo State, this time in Osu local government area. The Imo State Police Command says a police inspector attached to the Osu police station was killed as officers repelled armed bandits when they attacked the station Thursday night. Public Relations Officer of the State Command, Mike Abatum, says the Police Command's tactical team engaged the bandits who threw explosives and petrol bombs on the roof of the police station, damaging the roof and causing fire outbreak. Three bandits were killed while others escaped with bullet wounds. The command spokesman is appealing to members of the public to assist the police with credible information that will lead to the arrest of the escaped bandits and to report to the nearest police station any person seen with or treating bullet wounds. Uh, hospitals are also advised to ensure they report anyone who comes to them for treatment with a bullet wound.
Meanwhile, the Inspector General for Police, Usman al Khalibaba, has ordered the posting and redeployment of commissioners of police in 12 state commands, including the Federal Capital Territory. A statement released by the Force Public Relations Officer, Mr. Frankenberg, says that the posting of the senior officers is part of efforts at creating order, repositioning the force for greater efficiency, and providing stability in the internal security apparatus, as well as scaling up the fight against crimes and criminality in the country. Country. The affected state commands are Niger, Kwara, Nasarawa, Taraba, Benue, the FCT, Kogi, Kaduna, Jigawa, Enugu, Cross River, Bayosa, and Kebi states. The exercise is with immediate effect. And let's go over to our Borja studios where Linda Kigbe has some more stories. Hello, Linda. Hello, Millicent. Staying with security, the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Farouk Yaya, is visiting the troops in Kastina to provide some encouragement to the soldiers. The Army Chief is reaffirming the Army's total commitment to strengthen its fight against insurgency by urging them to take the battle to various bandits' enclaves in the country. Lieutenant General Yahaya disclosed this at the 171 Battalion of the Nigerian Army Dara during the second day of his two-day operational tour of all military formations under the 8th Division of the Nigerian Army. According to him, the essence of the tour is to encourage the troops as well as assess the operations with a view to appreciate and address their challenges. He observed that the military has so far begun gaining grounds with the support and synergy with other security agencies and relevant stakeholders. usual after assuming command to go to the ground and see the troops and see everything firsthand and also time opportunity for you to interact with officers and men on the ground and see their readiness assess their operations and also appreciate their conduct and challenges and encourage them uh, where necessary to do even more uh, that's the essence of this visit and i have been to Eight divisions since the day before. Came to Zamfara, to Katsina now in Daura. I'm moving forward up to Falgori and other areas. Uh, the essence is to reinvigorate our operations and strengthen them and now ensure that the troops take the fight to the enclaves of these criminals and uh, destroy them. That's what we are doing and that's what we continue to do. Uh, for every place I have passed, that is my message. We must conduct this operation and carry the battle to the enemy enclaves, both here in the northwest and even in the northeast where we are conducting them. And uh, this is done, of course, in synergy with other services and other security agencies and indeed other stakeholders. We are all partners. And together with this synergy, we will achieve results like we have seen. We have started gaining uh, grounds. This way will continue, and that's my message. There are challenges, sometimes you see them, but they are not unsurmountable, and with the support we have from the President Commander-in-Chief and the cooperation of other services, other agencies, we will get there. Away from security issues, the Kaduna state government is reassuring that all ongoing road projects embarked upon by the Governor Nassau Erifai administration will be completed in record time. The Managing Director, Kaduna State Roads Agency, Mr. Lawo Magaji, made this comment during an inspection of the Kaduna Zaria Kano Highway. <laughs> 
Kaduna, the capital of the defunct northern region and the third largest state in the country, is witnessing tremendous population growth. But public infrastructure is not measuring up with population growth, and neither has infrastructure followed its expansion into new districts. To bridge the infrastructural gap, the Governor Nasu El Rufai administration in 2019 launched the Kaduna Urban Renewal Project, aimed at restoring the state's original master plan. Along with ongoing road projects is the reconstruction of the Kawo Bridge located in Kaduna North local government area, along the Kaduna Kaduna Zaria Kanu Highway. The contract for the new Kawo Bridge project was awarded in November 2019, while the work began in January 2020, following the dismantling of the old single lane bridge, which could not address the problem of traffic congestion. The new bridge with a total length of 835 meters and 22 meters wide has a dual carriageway with shoulder and pedestrian walkway on the sides. It's designed with three ground rotaries and each of them expected to cater for the traffic from Zaria, Kanu and other northwest states, as well as vehicles from Kaduna Airport Road access, as well as outbound vehicles from the city center. The bridge is designed to take any heavy axle load and all traffic can ply and can use the bridge. We are not going to barricade it for a particular vehicles. This bridge will serve all the purpose because it's a dual carriage way bridge and all considerations has been taken care of in the design and in the construction of the bridge. And the residents of Kaduna State are anxious to see this project concluded. If you are in a hurry to go to Kano or Sokoto Axis, you cannot go. If you leave Abuja, let's say in two hours' time, if you come here, you spend more than three hours driving, going outside Kaduna. You will just be chock up here. So with this bridge, I think everything will be normalized. Yeah, motorists will, will find it freely. So far, the Kaduna State Government has constructed over 30 roads spanning more than 300 kilometers and also initiated a series of investments in urban infrastructure which are geared towards improving the economy of the state and the overall well-being of the residents. The national leadership of the Nigeria Union of Pensioners has called on the Hopu Zodima led administration in Imo State to recover all the pension funds and gratuities allegedly looted by previous administrations in the state. The national president of the union, Comrade Godwin Abumisi, disclosed this at the government house in the Wiri Imo State during a curtsy visit to Governor Hopu Zodima. The governor, on his part, promises to sustain his support for senior citizens in the state while seeking their support in dealing with the outstanding issues. You've seen my effort in trying to recover Imo people's assets and money from the former administration of Ukoracha. I've done a lot because I came with a mantra which recovery is one of them. But I'm almost being blackmailed out of it, reason being that even you, you are not speaking out. Because the bailout funds, we all know, we are transferred to a borrowed change, dollar sold to the people. Most of the money, so we can't see what it was used for. Whether Bella Fund or no Bella Fund, this is your entitlement that you should be that you should receive. Government has a responsibility to pay pensioners. Having worked, want their young youth youth age retired. Government has a responsibility to pay their allowances and graduate. And that's all from Abuja. Now to Teniola for business news.
banking. So easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Linda. Welcome to Business News. The Department of Petroleum Resources says it's set to capture all 33,000 filling stations in the country through its downstream remote monitoring system to curb fuel smuggling and other illegal activities in the sector. The DPR director, Saki Awalu, made this known today at a stakeholder engagement session in Lagos. According to the director, the system, also known as the E-Station, tracks the movement of products from the uh, depots to retail outlets. He further mentions that only registered petrol stations will be qualified to have their licenses renewed. So far, only 6,700 filling stations have been registered on the network, while the remaining 26,300 will be registered by December this year. Foreign direct investment is critical to improving the economic health of the African continent. The chairman of Foreign Investment Network, Mrs. Olainka Fayomi, made this known at a virtual roundtable on leadership and philanthropy in Africa. Yes. One thing we have also learned through our work at Foreign Investment Network is the place of philanthropy and leadership in the future that African countries are building. All over the world, philanthropy has helped countries to, among others, fight poverty, supported the building of health and educational infrastructures, improved our social economic standing, and helped to strengthen our democratic institutions. Indeed, philanthropy has helped make the world a better place. Also, at the heart of any success is good leadership. The right kind of leadership needed to harness the financial resources and social capital of philanthropy to building the Africa of our dreams, one which will work for us and many generations to come. Well, let's check in on the stock market now. The equities market closed on a positive note today as the all share index rose marginally by 0.02%. Laddie Williams tells us more. Well, the positive sentiment at intraday was sustained and brought the ball back to the NGX at the close of today's uh, trading session. The equity cap grew by about $4 billion today on the final trading day this week as the all-share index bounced back marginally uh, by 0.02% to close the week in the green. Uh, let's zoom into the activity chart now. 167.77 million units exchange hands in 3,267 deals uh, valued at $1.6 billion, which is a jump from yesterday's $1.4 billion. Uh, Transco Hotel led the gainers counter up 9.80%, closing at 3 naira. 92 Cobra, uh, followed by Regal Insurance and Owando. Flip over to the loser's counter, we see uh, Julie PLC, that's in pharmaceuticals, down 9.76%. We also see Africa Prudential and Cheap PLC in that uh, counter. Over to the sectoral performance, we see just uh, oil and gas is in the green, uh, up almost uh, 1%, while consumer goods uh, banking are in the red. Well, it's a good way to end the week, and we can only hope that the bull maintains its presence through the month of August. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Laddie Williams. It's back to you. Thanks a lot, Laddie. Well, in the U.S., the S&P 500 and Dow indexes closed at record highs today following a stronger-than-expected jobs report. Well, here are the closing numbers for Friday. And that's business news tonight. It's back to Millicent for the rest of the news at 10.
banking. So easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Taniola. A city in southwestern Afghanistan has become the first provincial capital to fall to the Taliban since the militants launched a sweeping offensive earlier this year. Officials say the Taliban has captured Zaranj in Nimroz province in a major blow to government forces. The insurgents continue to make rapid advances across the country as foreign troops withdraw. For more international news, here's Simon Pusey and Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Two Belarusian coaches have lost their Olympic accreditations after allegedly attempting to force an athlete to leave the Games in Tokyo. <laughs> The International Olympic Committee has confirmed that Artur Shimak and Yuri Maisevich have left the Olympic Village. They ordered the Olympic athlete Kristina Timonovskaya to fly home, which she refused to do. <laughs> Belarus says Ms. Timonovskaya was removed from the national team because of her emotional state, but the 24-year-old said she was removed because she criticised her coaches. The athlete has been granted a humanitarian visa in Poland, where she is waiting for her husband to join her. My husband, he's already in a, in a road by car to the Poland, so I will wait him today in the evening. He'll, he will be here maybe with me, so I just wait to him. When I was in Olympic Village, some coach and some uh, men from our team, they come to my room and uh, they say that I should say that I have some injury and come back to home if I will not do it, then I can get some problem in my country and uh, they don't know which one problem, but um, they, uh, after this day, they also come to my room and they say that I have no chance to run 200 meters and I should to come back to home. Greece has carried out mass evacuations overnight in the northern suburbs of Athens and on the nearby island of Evia as huge wildfires continue to rage. <laughs> Smoke continues to hang over the Greek capital and gale force winds are feared to help fan the flames. Firefighters from France, Switzerland, Sweden, Cyprus and Romania are all helping to tackle the fires. The Prime Minister of St Vincent and the Grenadines has been hospitalised after being injured at a protest against a proposed vaccine mandate. Here comes the Prime Minister. I think this is what they were waiting for. Ralph Gonsalves was walking through a crowd of demonstrators outside Parliament when he was hit in the head by a stone. Footage shows the Prime Minister bleeding as he was rushed away from the scene. He has been flown to nearby Barbados for treatment. The US has called on Iran's new president to return to talks on reviving a historic nuclear deal. Abraham Raisi was sworn in on Thursday, saying he would support any diplomatic plans to end sanctions on Iran. A spokesman for the US State Department warned that the window for diplomacy would not remain open forever. Footage has been released showing the historic California gold rush town of Greenville in ruins after one of the state's largest wildfires burnt the city. Videos from the scene show tall trees and structures burning as well as burned cars and remains of buildings. There have been no reports of deaths or injuries so far. The three-week-old Dixie fire is now the eighth largest in the state history. President Joe Biden has announced that thousands of Hong Kong residents would be offered a temporary safe haven in the U.S. <laughs> Mr. Biden said that because Hong Kong's freedoms were being violated by China, the U.S. would allow visitors to stay for a period of 18 months. China has reacted angrily to the announcement, describing the decision as a gross interference in Hong Kong's internal affairs. There have been celebrations aboard the German NGO rescue ship Sea-Watch 3 after it was finally assigned a port in Sicily. There were jubilant scenes as the 257 migrants were told the news. The humanitarian ship was one of two rescue boats that pulled 394 migrants from a dangerously overcrowded wooden boat in the Mediterranean overnight last week on Sunday. South Africa's jailed former president has been admitted to hospital less than a week before he is due in court. The South African Prison Department said a routine examination at the jail in KwaZulu-Natal, where Jacob Zuma is being held, prompted the authorities to take him to hospital outside the prison for further observation. 
And finally, the Guinness World Record for the oldest female powerlifter has been broken by Edith L. Murway, who will turn 100 years old this weekend. According to the Guinness World Records, at 99 years old, she holds the title for the oldest competitive powerlifter after lifting upwards of 150 pounds on the circuit in her home country of the United States. All the more extraordinary, as the Florida resident only started weightlifting eight years ago at the age of 91. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to Millicent in Lagos. Man, thanks, Simon. And to some Olympic updates, here's Ayotunde Balogu. Thanks, Middle Central. 2021 is turning out to be a good year for Italy as they produced a stunning performance to win the men's 4x100 meters relay Olympic title for the first time in their history and also set a national record of 37.50 seconds. Italy's victory gave their surprise 100 meters individual champion Lamont Marcel Jacobs his second gold of the Games. Jamaica's star-studded team has won the women's 4x100 meters relay final at the Tokyo Olympics. The Jamaican team, which includes all the medalists of the women's 100 meters competition at the Games, finished the race first in 41.02 seconds. USA ranked second with 41.45 seconds, while Britain came third with 41.88 seconds. Shawnee Miller Weibo of the Bahamas has successfully defended her Olympic 400 meters crown for the 27 year old from Nassau surged to the line in 48.36 seconds with Milady Paulino of the Dominican Republic taking silver and Alison Felix of the US claiming bronze. And a look at the medals table at the ongoing Tokyo Olympics. China retains top spot after an all-sporting action today with 36 gold, 26 silver and 17 bronze. The U.S. are in second position with 36 gold, I beg your pardon, with 31 gold, 36 silver and 31 bronze medals. Japan, the host, occupied the third position with 24 gold, 11 silver and 16 bronze. That sports news is back to you, Millicent. Thank you, Aitunde. And the main news again. The federal government today blew hot uh, and vowed to invoke the no work, no pay rule if the striking resident doctors fail to return to work by Monday. And that's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker. We have more updates, more stories on our website. It's channelcv.com. Have a good night and stay safe.